Hello, welcome to PSGR. You're listening to Jodie Brunning and I'm today I'm interviewing Dr. Simon Thornley. Um, Simon's a public health physician, a lecturer and researcher in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at the University of Auckland. And his research interests include epidemiological methods, low carbohydrate and low sugar approaches to diet, the link between scabies and the other important diseases of childhood, um, such as bacterial skin infection and rheumatic heart disease. So thank you, Simon. Thank you for joining us today. Well, thanks for having me, Jody. Pleasure to be here. It's great. And um, your your interest in, and I think we'll probably focus a lot on your research in in regards to carbohydrates and food addiction today, because I think you're in a very important space. And your your interest in this started uh, in your with your work in tobacco. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, uh, it was all a bit of an accident, really. I was working with a small a Swedish nicotine company, and they were testing a little product, a little bit like gum, but a snooze kind of thing, which you put under your lip, which was supposed to uh, improve sort of quit success um people trying to quit smoking and then at one stage i just opened the atkins book and uh really had from my medical training had been told it's a fad diet it's you know avoid it but they were really cheap at the secondhand bookstore. So I grabbed one. And uh, when I read it, uh, there were these fantastically uh, vivid descriptions by Atkins of some of his patients who were really struggling with their food. And most of many of the descriptions were really of somebody who was addicted. Um, and suddenly, I thought of myself and being scolded by my wife um, for eating all the chocolate biscuits after eating a pack. And I never intended to, just intended to have one, but somehow the whole pack would disappear on, on the odd occasion. And, uh, and suddenly I started putting my eating behavior in this kind of way of thinking about cravings, cues, um, withdrawal, um, uh, the feeling of taking off tight shoes, something not being right. And then I would eat this stuff, certain period, the sort of habitual nature of it, um, the craving. And it all seemed to make sense, but it was very controversial. Uh, sugar at the time, this is going back in about 2007, uh, was not considered to be a major problem by the public health or the medical establishment. I remember looking at this three vo volume tome uh, that I had for my physician training, which is the Oxford textbook of medicine, I tried to figure out by looking in the index uh, about sugar. And the only reference was in a chapter written about um, nutrition. And it said that sugar had been exonerated as a cause of diabetes. And that was the only reference in this thousand dollar three volume tome on sugar and I it really got me interested that this was a enormous area that we'd completely missed. And so then in um, 2008 you were a co-author of a paper called The Obesity Epidemic is Glycemic Index the Key to Unlocking a Hidden Addiction. Now please could you quickly give us a summary of glycemic index and then please talk about the response to that paper well, i was interested in uh, addiction uh, and addiction is often in, in the nicotine world is all about the delivery of nicotine and if you think about a cigarette it gets inhaled in the lungs and very quickly it's on the way in the arteries 
with the big surface area of the lungs goes straight up to the brain uh, and cigarettes are obviously fabulously addictive. Um, whereas nicotine patches, which you put on the skin, um, very slow absorption and uh, they're not so addictive. And so my initial thought was, well, having accepted that there is something to do with food that has an addictive quality, what is that quality? And seem to be related perhaps to glucose and the spike of glucose that you get after a meal. And that's measured by glycemic index. So you have a standardized uh, meal of carbohydrate and uh, a group of people are measured in their responses in terms of the glucose concentration, average glucose concentration in the one or two hours after the meal. And so that was the whole idea of that paper was that maybe glycemic index was um, responsible for this addictive property of food. And maybe that had something to do with the reason why we were all getting fat in the Western world. And it wasn't met with a lot of enthusiasm in the academic world, and particularly people who had, you know, were heavily invested in the sort of food and nutrition space. But um, it, it rang the bells of a certain journalist for the Daily Mail in the UK, and he put out a um, an article, and that article was syndicated around the world and uh, even made it on the front page of the Sydney Morning Herald. And uh, but curiously, wasn't a big thing in New Zealand, mainly, I think, because of uh, the fact that glycemic index hadn't really taken off here. But it, it just sort of showed me how uh, science can be kind of regional. Um, and also it can show it showed me how academics can um, completely be removed from the concerns of common people and um, uh, and different audiences can give very different responses to 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 ideas and you had a lot of people contacting you after this was widely published across the legacy media and did that that in, resulted you in you writing a paper called carbohydrate withdrawal is recognition the first step to recovery? That was someone that had contacted you. That was a case study. Yeah, so my inbox was kind of flooded at the time, and many people could, uh, you know, they just knew that they were addicted to food, and that they um, they would kind of plan these binges and uh, Overeaters Anonymous is an organisation that. It's completely devoted to this idea that food is addictive and, and using the kind of uh, stepwise model of recovery. Um, and so I had a number of discussions with people, sometimes over email, um, that, that just gave these very vivid symptoms of withdrawal symptoms uh, that were relieved with eating usually sugary or starchy food. Um, and so this, I felt, was important and certainly was <laughs> for myself. I found it very uh, important in terms of trying to recover because um, I was uh, really struggling with my waistline at the at, at this time and I was thinking this is my problem but I think this is also the world's problem uh, and a trip to the states kind of reinforced that for me and that I remember going to a nicotine conference and it was in the Hilton in Portland and I, I was anxiously anticipating lunch at a certain period of time and um, what came out was like two big cookies and a sort of bags of chips and 
um, sugary drinks. And I thought, man, this is sort of kids' birthday party stuff. This is not really highfalutin conference food. And I noticed that I was getting sick trying to eat this and really craved some decent food. That, and, and I thought, well, uh, I'm also feeling nauseated. And that's sort of a symptom of kind of uh, hitting the addiction center too hard. Uh, it happens with alcohol. It happens with tobacco. If you're not used to having a few cigarettes, often um, you just try, you're going to feel uh, like you want to vomit nauseated etc and it just seemed to me that the whole of the states you know people could easily eat these biscuits and uh, sugary food and, and in fact some of them were going back for more <laughs> so this idea of tolerance and the idea that um, you know it all seemed to fit within this addiction framework Yes, so the I mean, the average level of sugar intake in English speaking countries is about forty teaspoons a day. Is that correct? Yeah, well, that was a real revelation to me. I mean, mainly that was derived from sort of food disappearance data, which is not the most accurate data. It's actually very hard to get accurate data on sugar intake, mainly because. It's in so many things. It was really like the veils had been taken off my uh, eyes and suddenly I could see sugar everywhere in the supermarket. It was in the yogurt. It was uh, breakfast cereals. I had no idea that I had been eating uh, healthy muesli that was one quarter, 25% sugar. It was just... Uh, insane so um, most of us don't think about eating half a half a cup of sugar a day but um, when you actually look at the nutrition panels and see how much is in our food that we just don't notice uh, then you know it makes sense that adds up, doesn't it? And so at about the same time, it's interesting, I was looking at what else was happening at this time and Robert Lustig, his 2009, um, was it Sugar the Bitter Truth, uh, that that came out on YouTube and it, that's now had 24 million views and he's he's continued, he was a, you know, he was a paediatrician and endocrinologist looking at obesity. And so going back to yourself, I didn't realize that in 2011, you released a book, Sickly Sweet, Sugar, Refined Carbohydrate Addiction and Global Ob Obesity. And that was published by Nova Science. And so you, this book was, is the probably the first book in New Zealand to have discussed this relationship. Yeah, well, that was it was me being frustrated. I, I couldn't really get any attention in the medical world. So I thought, Let's try and go for the mainstream. And in the end, the book didn't make a huge splash, but at least it was kind of therapeutic in terms of me putting my ideas down on paper and uh, trying to articulate why I thought uh, the public health and medical community had completely missed sugar. Um, there were many other books around at the time that, uh, you know, probably were much more articulate than mine, such as Sweet Poison, such as uh, Gary Torb's book, um, The Diet Delusion, etc. You really went down um, and talked about food addiction and the addiction pathways. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Well, um, so... Uh, this idea that food was addictive was just, I mean, it's explained a lot of my behavior. So addictions really, I guess, a clinical syndrome where um, it's associated with automatic behavior. Um, so um, we don't even think about it. We just kind of need it. Uh, also, um, withdrawal sim symptoms uh, in the tobacco world um, most 
smokers when they stop smoking they don't say oh i've got urges or cravings uh which is kind of the classic withdrawal syndrome symptoms but they just say i don't feel quite right and if i have a cigarette that makes me feel right again um and uh and usually those symptoms last for about a month and if you abstain uh like with cigarettes then your br brain kind of readjusts and suddenly you don't need the um uh, the drug anymore um but it's really getting over that first month which is really tough and so i started to notice that i had some of the same features so tolerance uh withdrawal symptoms that feeling of not feeling right the loss of control the uh behavior that was rather erratic um associated with addiction and it just made sense that sugar and carbohydrates refined starches seem to be the the real drivers of the addictive food that were a problem and so and talking to people in overeaters anonymous who described basically what was like a a real you know what what other people would have would associate with an episode of sort of mainlining um opiate opioids or drugs of addiction they were doing the same stuff with food they were kind of planning these binges and they would just be completely out of control they would just go over the top feel really guilty the next morning um feel really sick sometimes they would they'd have to avoid sugar completely to try and recover sometimes they would get some sugar in foods that they didn't suspect had sugar and it would bring back this flooding kind of urges and cravings um so and yeah there was just not a lot in the medical literature and and so i felt that you know somebody had to really say something about this it was a big deal and yet yeah and there was certain people could uh, relate to it so for example rat researchers would say um rats will go for sweetened condensed milk over cocaine um they knew about it um psychiatrists i talked to um would say that often in the acute units people would sort of eat the milo by the spoonful they wouldn't actually sort of use it in the the usual manner of sort of making a dilute cup of hot chocolate uh so 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 various people could relate to it but um generally people in the nutrition world didn't like it it didn't really fit with their model no and in your book you were talking about the distinction between the homeostatic and hedonic mechanisms of hunger because there are different anatomical centers in the brain which which are involved so it's not it's we can't just say there's one linear pathway so there's the hypothalamus you know please can you explain yeah well uh, in addiction um dopamine is kind of the reward chemical and is thought to be sort of a central part of it and uh so there's sort of a, a positive reinforcement uh, which sort of comes from the really kind of hard drugs where people get this sense of intense pleasure when they you know take shoot up heroin or cocaine something like that uh but with drugs that are a little bit more subtle like uh tobacco nicotine uh even caffeine for example it's thought that it's not uh, the experience is not quite like that um that basically your, your brain gets accustomed to this regular 
sort of dose of these drugs and if it doesn't get it it starts to sort of it says i'm i'm going to feel i'm make you feel a little bit not right you can't concentrate you might have urges you're kind of distracted you can't do your work uh, and then you have the drug and you feel better again. And that's what I was thinking um, was similar to what was happening with caffeine and with tobacco, um, with sugary food. Um, obviously, there's a bit of uh, variation in that some people really have these intense binges with sugary food. Um, but... Uh, also, I thought it's quite subtle, you know, a bit like the what I noticed at the nicotine conference where just it seemed like this cohort of professorial types uh, in the nicotine research world weren't even thinking about it. They could just chug back the sugar um, and, uh, you know, the the... Uh, the explosion of sort of sugary stuff in the States with high fructose corn syrup, I think, making it cheap and, you know, it's yummy. Um, and, and, and it's just, you know, that that this was a very subtle addiction that was happening over a large group of people and that maybe this had something to do with the obesity epidemic, which was something that was really on the public health radar was, uh, you know, why are we getting fat? You know, we're, we're doing all the right things. The nutritionists have got the right theories, the right advice. Yet we're all getting fatter. Why is that? And this seemed to provide some explanation. Yes, and um, and because the time to hit, I, I I sort of like that explanation. There's that that time to hit before, and that was a, had a massive role in um, just just creating that greater addic addictive urge. But we're now understanding, I believe that you know, it's not just sugar; it's refined starches. So there is a you know these all spike in you know spike insulin. Yeah, well, I think initially I had this belief that maybe it was just sugar that was the problem. Well, I started out with glycemic index, which really focuses on refined starch, and then realized that a lot of the, um, uh, that actually a lot of the descriptions around uh, addiction were in relation to sugar. And sugar actually gets a bit of a free pass with glycemic index. And gly a lot of the sort of ardent um, glycemic index zealots, uh, they think that sugar is actually okay because it has a relatively low glycemic index, which is related to the physiology of fructose versus glucose. Uh, so, yeah, and I guess migrated from being very sugar-centric to realizing that coming back to that sugar and refined starches and actually, um, you know, improving health by uh, reducing carbohydrates in general um, was very useful. And uh, in particular, the diabetes community had picked up on this and we're getting really good results. So I started to get involved in the low carb community, particularly in Australia. Yes. And the, the health survey in New Zealand, the 2022-2023, we have about one in three adults in New Zealand classified as obese. And that's a little bit more than just five years ago, where the children um, are now aged 2 to 14. Uh, we have about 13.5% classified as obese, whereas five years ago, 11.6% were classified as obese. And among children, Maori uh, and Pacifica living in the most deprived neighbourhoods are most likely to be classified as obese. So we'll see. So we're seeing 27.21.7% of Maori and 27.8% of Pacifica children. And so it seems really surprising that there is not a large cohort of researchers in New Zealand considering the, the role of refined starches and sugars in the diet. And we can we can we know that 
from 10 years, a paper looking at studies 10 years ago in toddlers, amount of ultra processed food those toddlers were consuming from an early age was between, you know, 30 and 50% of their diet. And we can only wonder what, what young people in, are consuming and ultra processed foods are predominantly made of, you know, refined starches, including sugar. I mean, how, how do we move in New Zealand on this? Why, why is there... Why is there a reluctance or an, a lack of scientific cohorts researching this? And why is this not in health policy? What is happening here? Yeah, I think it's really interesting. And I think it goes back a long way in terms of where nutrition, traditional nutrition has kind of considered what the problem is. And uh, so... Traditionally, it was thought that fat was the main bogey, mainly because it's it's all about energy, and fat is particularly energy dense compared to carbohydrates and protein. And so the the idea uh, also there was a suggestion, um, mainly from some early st uh, ecological studies by a chap called Ansel Keys, that uh, countries that ate more animal fat uh, had a higher rate of heart disease so this idea that you kill two birds with one stone remove the fat remove the animal fat it would all be happy and healthy and then so that was the predominant message in the 60s and 70s uh, but and then of course sugar and refined starch if you if you're going to say that some things are out then people are going to gravitate to the things that are in, <laughs> and uh, those, uh, and particularly sugar and uh, starch, um, increased in terms of uh, overall proportion of the diet. And um, I think that's been part of the difficulty that I experienced in 2008 when I raised sugar as an issue was that that was batting up against some of these ideas. Um, but um, slowly, sugar became... Uh, it, it was, the evidence to deny that sugar was a problem was just overwhelming. Uh, so eventually it became accepted um, but still there's these divergent paradigms in nutrition I think and one central has a central focus on energy and kind of sees sugar as a problem but it's empty calories whereas um, on the sort of low carb so the scale we're seeing insulin is the real major problem um, that's linked to diabetes, heart disease, etc. Uh, and sugar and uh, starch is really the the main driver. So uh, I think that's where that's why it hasn't really been taken up in, in in large numbers by researchers generally uh the older paradigm around energy and in that paradigm there's no such thing as addiction food addiction we're all just we're all just making choices rational choices related to food and i, I think that's um my belief is that that is just uh you know it's it's not realistic yeah it's it's it, and when we look at many many books and and many documentaries looking at the the work that the the fast food and the ultra processed food industry the work they do to ensure the optimum palatability of their product there's a heck of a lot of technology going into those products uh in 2019 you um co-authored a paper called How Reliable is the Statistical Evidence for Limiting Saturated Fat Intake. So you took a really big look at what the the, the influential Hooper meta-analysis. Could you talk a little bit about this paper, please? Sure, yeah. Well, uh, so I guess the sugar story really turned my world upside down of what I 
thought about the evidence relating to what was the main risks for cardiovascular disease, obesity, diabetes. And so I started to look in depth at what I'd been told at med school. And one of the uh, one of the main beliefs was that eating animal fat, any fat which is kind of solid at a room temperature, so, you know, what's around your steak, butter, um, cream, fatty yogurt, that sort of stuff, um, was a problem. And I, I noticed there was a few strange inconsistencies. So, for example, uh, coconut oil is mostly saturated fat right it's solid at room temperature but that was okay um uh, whereas animal fat that was also saturated wasn't okay um and so I, I thought well let's have a look at the evidence and and the top shelf evidence is generally in the epidemiology world as meta-analyses of randomized trials and uh and, and really uh, there wasn't a sort of clear-cut resolution of the evidence. There was about 10 meta-analyses that people like me could hang their hat on that said there's no relationship between saturated fat and heart disease. But people on the other side of the debate would hang their hat on the Hooper meta-analysis and the influential Cochrane uh, collaboration journal uh, and say that Yes, it proves that saturated fat still is a problem. Well, I, I thought, well, let's have a look at it close, a, a bit closer. And the interesting thing was that there was no association between reducing saturated fat and all-cause mortality. Um, that's interesting because all-cause mortality has a number of benefits as an outcome. First of all, it's less prone to manipulation, less prone to measurement error, because most of us, between studies, know what a death and, you know, conversely, what somebody's alive looks like. It's measured without much uh, er error. And it also sort of takes into account um, the risks and benefits. Basically, if you look at an all-cause mortality analysis, you're saying... Does reducing saturated fat make us live longer on average? And uh, the answer from the meta-analysis that people on the other side of the debate were pointing to said, no, it doesn't make us on average live longer. Uh, and then there was all uh, CVD mortality, again, no benefit. And then there was CVD events, uh, so heart attacks and strokes. And there was a small benefit. And what I found was that that was very dependent on the method of analysis. Um, there's something called a random effects meta-analysis. And one thing we know about random effects meta-analysis is that it tends to be more biased when there's a lot of publication bias. And publication bias is when researchers, if they get a result that they don't like, they tend not to publish it. They leave it in the file drawer. It's also called the file drawer problem. And there was some evidence of publication bias in the study. And what did I find? I found that actually if you use the technique that gets around that issue, uh, inverse variance heterogeneity, it's a bit of a technical thing, that even then this benefit, apparent benefit, disappears. So basically I was arguing that the favorite meta-analysis by the people who argue that saturated fat is still a problem despite this ocean of other evidence saying no, that uh, really it's an artifact of the, the, the evidence in favor is an artifact of the method. Uh, and it's not actually reliable. Uh, and that was the conclusion. And I was surprised I was able to get that published. For so many, for so long, the dietary fat has been, been the driver of this 
feels so logical, but instead it's starting to appear that it's a logical fallacy and there's quite a lot of literature looking at the contradiction. But, of course, people that are have got their feet stuck into one one idea then you know science science moves along one death at a time as they say yeah well it's it's it really is something that is such a integral part of nutrition uh thought that you cannot really that many people in the epidemiological or public health nutrition world just won't want to discuss it um it's very deeply ingrained i mean if you look at the food uh the health stars rating which uh, you'll see at the supermarket you'll see that it's heavily weighted uh against anything that has uh, a lot of saturated fat so for example macadamia nuts were i think two three stars at one point um, whereas a breakfast, heavily processed breakfast cereal that was 25% sugar would get four and a half stars. Uh, and, you know, it's just pretty clear to me which product I'd rather have in terms of trying to maintain my health. Yes, and you've seen your work in the dental area. So is as that's been fairly constant too, because the end in 2020, you released a paper with Hancock's in and Schofield talking about nutritional guidelines for dental care versus the evidence. Is there a disconnect? What were you trying to draw attention to in that paper? Well, I think uh, a forgotten area in medicine, mainly because doctors learn absolutely nothing about the teeth, is that sugar and refined starches affect the teeth and actually uh, fat and particularly dairy fat tends to be protective uh, of the teeth and so what we're saying here is that actually you know if you look at the nutrition world from a sort of insulin carbohydrate sugar perspective there's no discordance between trying to improve your overall metabolic health um, with a diet that both helps your teeth and your waistline and your pancreas and your coronary arteries. Whereas if you uh, follow the traditional advice, then there's this strange sort of dichotomy where you're trying, you've got to eat one sort of diet to improve your metabolic health and then another diet to improve your dental health so there's this uh you know things line up uh <laughs> in terms of evidence and um uh, you know they become a lot simpler from um a, an approach that really uh sees dietary carbohydrates and sugar is the primary issue in the diet um, rather than fat and saturated fat so that's what we were trying to draw attention to and in fact when we started to talk about sugar um, we really had a, a difficulty cutting through until people like Robert Beaglehold Jr uh, who was a chief dental officer of uh, Nelson um, and various other dentists, um, you know, said, look, this is a no-brainer. We see people coming into our clinic clutching their Coke bottle and it's pretty obvious what the cause is. Um, so the dentist coming, swinging in behind the sugar story was a real help and um you know so we saw these uh, not only was there a synergy in terms of trying to get the public health message out there but it just seemed to make sense from a scientific point of view too 
And so the work you've been doing with the dentists has been under the name of FIS. That's the group that you've been working on. Uh, yeah, so, well, we uh, really, a colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Gerhard Sunborn, who has uh, sort of had his career more in the sort of health promotion, Pacific health space. And so, you know, the epidemiology relating sugar to poor health seemed to me to be um, fairly clear and fairly conclusive. Um, so really the issue is how do we do something about it? So uh, with, and particularly also, I think the addiction thing uh, has um, is important for educators because uh, if you want your children in the classroom, your students to engage in what you're doing, if they're addicted to sugar, they are probably going to have some behavioral challenges and they're probably going to be distracted by their withdrawal symptoms uh, and they're not going to participate in what you're doing. And, and so we, there was a few stories related to this, particularly a primary school, very inspiring primary school in Otara. Uh, and uh, the principal was really struggling with the school. The school was kind of failing. And she decided at one point in time, really put a lot of effort into it, engage the community and said, basically, kids can't come through the school gates with sugary food and drink. And if they do, we're going to take it off them and we're going to give them something without those things, um, some, some healthier food. And... Uh, although there was a bit of resistance, um, overnight the tone of the school just completely changed and uh, they stopped selling the top sizes of uniform, uh, kids became much more engaged in the classroom and just sort of became part of the school identity. You haven't seen this translating into government policy at the highest levels? Uh, well, we've been advocating for it, um, and certainly, uh, you know, the opportunity was there, you know, um, but it's, uh, I, I guess, with a sort of muddly nutrition space about what's healthy, what's not, um, you know, you get a lot of various different interest groups wanting to do different things, so there's there's not really a very uh, sort of strong voice at a government or a policy or a nutrition level saying, hey, we really need to protect our kids from sugar and refined starch. That's the problem. Uh, let's do some, uh, do some, you know, get some policies out there that embed this in New Zealand schools. Uh, but uh, there's been some very inspiring other schools that have done that. And there's another one, uh, I think it's Glenvale School in, uh, in Porirua, which a uh, very similar story. And, you know, they just improved out of sight the engagement that the teachers had. Yes. And, and this so, is more, it's more than just the sugar sweetened beverages. It's sugary food as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, the sugary drinks are probably, if you think about it from an addiction point of view, uh, you know, drink just goes straight down the hatch. Uh, it's sort of short time to hit. It's probably one of the most harmful ways of delivering sugar, but, you know, toffee and <laughs> sweets and, yes. uh, you know, even sort of harmless things that like, We've all sort of accepted like muesli bars, which are, you know, 25, 30% sugar yet in many kids' lunch boxes. Uh, so Fizz was really about trying to raise some issues there. Maybe we should tax sugary drinks like the UK did. They tax the high concentration drinks. Um, you know, so really trying to say, look, sugar's a massive problem. We really can't do this by uh, giving individuals advice at the GP. We really have to do something as a society 
yes. to, to try and address it. Yes, and the the 2015 Food and Nutrition Guidelines, for example, they acknowledge that there's convincing evidence for sugary drinks being associated with increased body weight and obesity and type 2 diabetes. But they they say that di you know dietary fiber reduces the risk of cardiovascular disease and diabetes by improving blood lipid and blood glucose levels. Why is that not why is that not really accurate? If a young person was reading that, what would they not understand about that? Yeah, well, I I, I think there's there's all sorts of uh there's, there's all sorts of evidence related to you know food different foods and uh health outcomes and and so you mentioned fiber there i mean the issue with fiber is that if you're eating fiber you're generally eating less of the refined starchy stuff so is it the eating fiber or is it the fact that you're not eating the other stuff um so really trying to synthesize the evidence, um, put it together. I mean, you know, I, I've got nothing against fiber, but um, uh, really I think there needs to be a sort of uh, a, an appreciation. Look, you know, yes, there's some arguments over the evidence, but we're all on the same page about sugar. Let's do something about it. Uh, refined starch, we're all on the same page. Let's do something about it. Um, but uh, we've got this very confused space, um, and you know the, and generally the the sort of number one, number two things that uh, people in the sort of traditional nutritional world will talk about is fat, salt, then maybe sugar, um, and so uh, you just got very different sort of you know competing confused messages that filter up to a political level and it seems at that age at that you know in the two to 18 year old age we're seeing the increase in pre-diabetes the the increase in higher insulin levels the triglyceride problems but if we're only thinking that dietary fiber that if that's the predominant message reduces the risk of cardiovascular disease and diabetes we we think that our, that muesli bar is is fine we we think that you know we, we can have broccoli and that's our fiber we, but we can still have you know the the white potatoes the white you know and, and the bread and we think that bread with some some seeds in it won't spike our insulin but it will so it it feels like the nu nutritional guidelines don't really allow for a, an honest appraisal for young people so they might prevent pre-diabetes and diabetes. Do you think that's correct? Yeah, well, I think uh, we really need to have a, a good, hard look at the evidence and really try and, as I said, sort of really focus on what the bogeys are in the nutrition space. It's, you know, having this sort of, if you talk to enough nutritional epidemiologists, you wouldn't eat anything. <laughs> you know, uh, there's, there's somebody that's going to say this is bad, that's bad. Um, you know, it's uh, unfortunately, and that confusion just um, means that there's this kind of an action um, and, you know, unhelpful things, you know. For example, low-fat milk, some people uh, want to introduce that into schools as a sort of, you know, must be the, you know, the way to go. And to me, I see that as completely unhelpful. Yes. One final thing I'd like to ask you about is the, the health system indicators framework. And I'm just going to put them up here so people can see them. But why do you think they're, they're not good enough when we think about the role of food in society and the increasing evidence of diet-driven disease and from sugar through to obesity, through to diabetes, why do you think they're, they're not sufficient? Well, I think uh, the experience that I've had with the indicators really comes from my work uh, 
in Counties Manukau uh, as a public health physician, where I used to have to report on these indicators. And many of them are basically related to the health system, what the health system does. And this encapsulates this idea that the health system is really predominantly what the health system does is predominantly the cause of our good or bad health. Uh, whereas my view is quite different in that basically what we put in our mouths is uh, very important in terms of our health um, and particularly avoiding sugar and refined starches. And uh, also some of the indicators, so for example, ambulatory sensitive hospitalizations, which is a terrible term, it basically means any disease that's thought to be prevented by medical uh, intervention or primary care, GP kind of stuff, you know, it, they basically just seemed it encompasses about 200 different conditions. Uh, and so it doesn't really focus um, the health sector on doing any one thing. Uh, uh, so, you know, to, and back in my day, it was all about, you know, when you ever you talked about um, ambulatory sensitive hospitalizations, just about every manager in the hospital would talk about flu vaccinations um, and that was you know that was it um, so it, it there just wasn't this kind of rationalization of um, how we could really improve health uh, and you know what sort of strategies and it was always co constantly a battle to try and get diet uh, and sugar on the agenda. There was a few small wins, like, for example, hospitals got rid of sugary drinks in their vending machines and in the um, uh, sort of candy stands um, in the hospitals that used to greet you as you went through the front door, they got taken away. Um, but really, you know, I mean, even... For example, hospital food now uh, I see is totally, you know, most of it's refined starch, I guess, mainly because it's got to be cheap. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, in terms of prompting uh, useful innovations to improve health, I don't see the, the indicators as being particularly helpful. Um, you know, uh, another thing that I thought I was going to be celebrated for was um, uh, looking through ambulatory sensitive hospitalization, seeing that skin infections was a large part of that. And, uh, saying hey guys look there's a whole lot of things we can do around scabies and uh, improving treatment improving the recognition and we can actually make a difference to some of these indicators and basically the message was oh we've already got our plan related to those indicators we're not really interested um so yeah, I that was sort of my experience of dealing with the indicators that they um, really didn't seem to see the big picture in terms of how to make populations healthier. Yes, and so it's within a, a medical framework. So you're going to be ill and it's how we treat you that is how our health system works rather than how we can prevent you becoming ill in the first place. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think some of them are there because uh, they're sort of politically things that people notice about the health system. How much do I wait in the emergency department if I've got cancer? How long do I does it take for me to get my first appointment? Those sorts of things. And I think some of them are quite important, but in terms of, you know, a really expansive view of 
how we can address New Zealanders' health, it just really leaves me feeling a, a, a little depressed and <laughs> want to lie down. <laughs> well, on that, on that note, let's let's go and think up some ideas for policies that perhaps are outside of the health system, that may be in the educational system, that may have to do with access to whole food and access to healthy food, and let's keep going. Um, thank you, Dr. Simon Thornley, for your time today. Thanks, Jody. Really appreciate it.